Three, two, one, and we are back. Hey, Julie, it's Sunday yes, again. I know, the Sunday show. Here we are. Yeah, you know, we are just reflecting. Uh, Julie and I had planned a trip to Germany. And the UK. And, and Ohio. The UK, <laughs> and Ohio. And yeah, we were planning, actually, we were talking about driving over to, uh, from Germany, flying over to Paris, too. Yeah. That isn't it's happening. It's going to be a big trip. We planned that, yeah, we planned that last year and canceled it about, uh, what would it have been, about early March when we figured this pandemic was going to become something mm-hmm. of a, a, you know, a global problem as it had. So yep. go past us for got, getting all of our money back and having That's predicted right. it was going to get worse. It's a travel gap year, as they say. Well, I don't mind. It's all know. right. Yeah, Getting exactly. Done. So what's on your mind? Oh, hold on. I got to give a disclaimer prior to starting the Sunday show. Because <laughs> oh. I always I always think there's, <laughs> right. there's somebody. What if list- it's their first time? Uh-oh. Right, exactly. Somebody's listening to us for the first time mm-hmm. and they're going like, who are these loons? Um, this is not our normal show. This is their Sunday show where Julie and I, it's uh, we used to call it Sunday debrief at the beach. We might actually, you know, in essence, call it that. We're sitting in our villa in Puerto Rico. And we're not technically at the beach. We're probably about a, what, five-minute walk from yeah. the beach? And, um, yeah, we're just chilling. And, and we used these Sundays to um, defrag from the previous week and, and then share with you guys what we're thinking about. Because what we're thinking about is generally from the culmination of what Julie and I are studying. We're always studying something and all of our coaching calls with, and communications with you guys. So when we're talking about things, what's bouncing around in our brains is essentially the stew that's created from all those, you know, thoughts as entrepreneurs ourselves, but also helping all of you guys to balance out those thoughts as you move forward in your real estate businesses. And this past week, um, we had a lot of interesting, and I, Julie, I have no, we have no agenda, so we'll just see where we go. We might end up talking about aliens or something. You never know. But uh, yeah, this past week, we spent a lot of time talking about distressed real estate, distressed mm-hmm. real estate being REOs and short sales. And there were some interesting conversations that bubbled up as a result because we said the shorts or that, uh, you know, people don't understand that distressed real estate isn't just basically the house that's, you know, uh, with the vagrants living in it that has needs to be backhoed. Distressed real estate, by definition, is a sort, of course, a house with a condition problem. You know, any well, kind it of building. can be, but it doesn't have to be. Right. And it's a financial distress. I mean, those are really the two largest buckets. And we focus on primarily as we focus on the financial distress properties, of which there are going to be abundance of them. Um, and we have absolutely no doubt it's going to start in earnest probably early next year. And by this time next year, um, you're going to be seeing a lot of um, distressed properties, financially distressed, distressed, short sales, REOs, how fast it comes out when, you know, if there's a surge, I don't think any of that's going to happen. Julie and I think there's no reason to believe that it, there's not going to be a slow, orderly, sort of graceful exit for a lot of the homeowners that can no longer afford or choose to stay in their homes any longer. And uh, right, I mean, overall, that's what's going to happen. There's, and we're, if you want to, I don't really want to talk about that today. I don't mm-hmm. know if you do, but we could if you wanted to. I'm just yeah. saying, I kind of, I don't like talking about distressed real estate. It's distressing. Well, but the reason that we're talking about it is we study the canary in the coal mine syndrome, the early warning signs to see what's on the horizon so that we can best coach our coaching clients, our members of our different classes, and of course our podcast listeners, so that they're not caught off guard and they, you know, can do the best job for themselves, their families, and their clients. So that's why we had a little foray into the distress discussion. And to your point, you know, I I think a lot of people think it, it just means that it's some piece of crap crap property that's you know having a hard time with its maintenance but in fact it's possible to have a distressed property that's a financial term distressed property that's just you know the loan's not being paid yep. and some of those you know we saw the last go around some of them were actually in pretty good condition they can even be new construction yep so it's something to watch for and i have seen in my premier coaching calls you know between you and me and all of our harris coaches we talk to hundreds of agents every week I've seen a little inkling of of this from people, you know, maybe they had a small down payment and lost their job and they haven't gotten it back yet. You know, we're seeing a little a little touch of it here and there. But I think the other story from last week was the early reporting and predictions from companies like CoreLogic of bellwether markets like Orange County. There are a couple of articles that we pulled out of the Orange County Register, you know, predicting depreciation that can be a cause of distressed property as well. So the, these are all things that we're watching. 
so the bottom line is distressed real estate is distressing, not necessarily for the reasons that you might believe. It's mostly distressing because it just adds fuel to the fire for agents to start feeling really, you know, out of control. And that's mm-hmm. the distressing part for us because we right. it, it's not that difficult of stuff to coach and train you guys to do. Honestly, it's kind of like pretty straightforward. And you, once you get past your emotional issues that you have with regards to having to ch- shift and change, then you realize it's just something new to know. And that's really what we're, we're hoping all of you get. But the, the stressful part for us is in the intervening in the next year, most likely, because Julie and I will be the, one of the only ones really warning the industry about this. Mm-hmm. You guys will notice there's going to be a lot of people that will start, you know, trying to pick fights with us because they're going to, and yeah. this happened last time too, and we still towed the line. We're not going to back off this time either. It's from all the people that are invested in things not changing that they don't like anything that's going to essentially uh, provide a counter narrative for all of you guys. And you know what? It's not their best interest necessarily that we're on the lookout for. It's yours. And that's what they're only primarily interested in their best interest. So they're going to be stuck in confirmation bias wanting to, you know, have you believe the same thing that the market's going to be the same and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I heard some guys the other day, I read an article. He was supposedly some real estate expert talking about he was talking to brokers and office managers, again, some high flutin guy, talking about how agents need to be taught how to sell real estate on the premise that it's a great investment. And I thought to myself, what, what a jackass. That's what I thought. Because, <laughs> I, of course, agents know how to sell real estate as on the premise that it's a great investment. That's the only that's, way that's, they know how to sell exactly real estate. Done. They don't know how to sell real estate any other way. You know, fear of missing out and greed. That's the easy button when it comes to, you know, coming out of a hot seller's market. So I don't know why he was even thinking that that would be a good thing to say but here's the real you know bad part of what he was saying the reality of it is is that how are you going to sell real estate when nobody believes it's a great time to sell or to buy real estate because they keep on reading everywhere and they keep on seeing that prices are falling exactly how are you going to explain non-investor mom and pop normal joe and josephine buyer how are you going to explain to them that yes your property might be worth less the day after you close but you know what you still need a place to live right i mean these types of conversations are normal in a changing market normal in a buyer's market and look how ill prepared our industry is our industry wants to basically keep on beating the drum like the sky is the clouds are going to part it's going to be an amazing seller's market and buy now if not you're not so that's it's addicted to this sort of greed cycle of basically selling selling on the you know old school well, method of it's fear of miss, more fun. fear of missing out right that's what everyone falls on uh, leans on and you know it works that's the easiest way to get people to be motivated sure. have them be fearful that they're going to lose something but the reality of it is is that this time next year and some of you guys are already experiencing this in your marketplaces that ain't going to work it's just not going to work Buyers are going to take themselves out of the market uh, earlier this year than they did in the previous year for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and then, you know, where the power is always going to be, always has been and always will be, is on the listing agent side of things. Now, here's another little fascinating little tidbit, little brain teaser for you guys to be thinking about. The reason that, like, so list Julie and I, think of somebody else in the industry that's at our level that basically tells you guys to focus on becoming listing agents. Who else says that? They don't say that, do they? They don't tell you what we tell you. They tell you how to do branding, do teams, do all this other stuff, but they don't tell you how to drill down and focus on chasing listings. Why? Because it's a skill that you have to learn, not something they can necessarily sell you. They want to sell you something because they don't have the skills themselves to teach you how to develop the skill, how to actually go after listings. You know, so that these are all the types of thoughts that you guys need to be maybe considering having as we move forward in this changing market. And then when you feel yourself you know, experiencing this resistance, the point of resistance where you almost are offended, where you're mad. If you hear Julie and I say, especially Julie, she's very <laughs> offensive. <laughs> I try to be. <laughs> but when you hear us saying something, or anybody really, that's offensive to you, stop for a second and question why you're offended. Like, and what you'll discover is within maybe a question or two of like sort of drilling down and asking why yourself why you're offended, you realize you have no freaking clue why you're offended. It's just an emotion. It's a, an emotion that's not sort of rooted in any sort of intellect. And you're just reacting because you've always reacted that way because maybe other people that you know have reacted that way and you've never stopped to say, huh, you know what? Why am I reacting that way to that competing thought to whatever my paradigm is? Why don't I just realize that maybe I need to upgrade my software and my way of thinking? That's what this time in history is all about. 
And look, we're not preaching political or Julie and I are going to avoid the social topics. We're going to avoid politics. We're going to avoid all that stuff the best we can because for the sake of us doing our jobs for you, it's irrelevant. Hey, I just had an, we had an interesting conversation yesterday. Which if one? You, I wonder if we can have this conversation without violating that rule of not being political huh. or talking about social topics. Try. Why is it nowadays mm -hmm. that when people... Oh, you know what got me on this? What? Is you and I are hiring right now for our company, mm -hmm. right? We're looking for people to work for us that are going to work as part of our sales team as a new member coach. Mm -hmm. And we've been running jobs and we've been doing lots of interviews and, you know, going through the process of trying to find some really, you know, great people to add to our already stellar people on our group, in our team, in our business. And it's fascinating to me how many of these people, of all, of all ages, you'd think this would be a millennial thing, but it's not, hmm. think that they're... Uh, don't understand that as an employer, an employer is not hiring you for your political views, no. your religious views, your social stance, your anything. The employer is hiring you based on your ability to perform the task at the highest level. for your skill. And it's fascinating to me how many resumes yeah. we get where they'll talk a little bit about their work history, but then they'll talk about like the, all this other stuff that has nothing to do with their ability to actually perform um, the job. Yeah. And, and I that, that got me thinking, there actually has been this sort of weird, bizarro, parallel universe that's formed that businesses have you know catered to, mm -hmm. where people think that a job is someplace or an employer is someone who's supposed to be your coach, your guru, your mentor, so who's supposed to be your somehow a place where you're supposed to go. Right, and that all your beliefs should be in alignment and that, right. you know, that that's somehow part of the job. That's what they say. They say they're looking for some place to work that's in alignment with their beliefs. Well, they're being political, and I got news for you, sister and brothers who are applying for us, with us, and if you're basically leading on your resume that you're looking for something like that, we're not calling you back. Because you're just not walking into the workplace with us with the mindset of service and being of service to other people. You're making it about yourself. Yeah. And that's not going to ever work. And it work. is not a replacement for skill. If you're leading right. that on your resume, it's because you can't or won't or don't understand that you're supposed to be leading with skill. It's a job. You're not applying for vacation. You're not applying to join somebody's family or cult. You know, it's a job. And you get paid for the outcome of the work that you put in. That's it. And here's the thing a lot of you guys hopefully will figure out very soon is that there the businesses might cater publicly to or perceive or, or maybe are making it so that you believe that they're, you know, essentially in alignment with whatever your social justice perspectives are, your political leanings are. But at the end of the day, I got news for you. They are only going to be focused on the product that you deliver to them. You could be the most amazing, you know, most wired in, socially perfect, politically and whatever. And, but if you can't, you know, code or you can't make that barista, be a good barista or whatever it is or that sell. they're hiring or sell. Yeah, really. Or sell. Then you're not much value to any employer. And so just a word of caution to all of you. Um, Make sure that when you're engaging with your sellers and your prospective buyers that you're not leading with your, you know, social justice stuff. Because even though they might appreciate you virtue signaling, and virtue signaling goes both ways. Conservatives true. do it and liberals do it, you know. It's not just a, a funny little behavioral quirk on one side of the political spectrum. Everyone does it to some degree, you know, which is kind of funny. Consciously and subconsciously. Yeah, I mean, we do it sure. subconsciously. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, you, you don't even know how someone's going to perceive something you said as a virtue signal or not. You know, That's you never true. really know. Especially uh, nowadays. By the way, virtue signaling, for those of you who don't know, is basically when somebody will throw something out to try to, uh, let them know that they're in alignment with your virtues. That's all it is. Or that they feel superior to your virtues. Yeah, that's the other thing you typically It's like say. when you run across people walking their dogs and, and you know, they ask where your dog came from. And, oh, yeah. And then they <laughs> tell you how many shelters that they volunteer at. And somehow because your dog's from a breeder that you're lesser than or something like that. That's just one example. There's lots, lots of different examples. So... You know, but I think that it convolutes conversations, and I think that it's gotten to the point where people are so walking on eggshells all the time about yep. everything that you can't even barely have a conversation for real for fear that you'll be on you know the wrong end of the spectrum. So I think when you're in front of your buyers and your sellers, it, you just have to be a republicrat. And it's really how is it it's even gone appropriate that, to, though, right? to? Of course, yeah. But it's not appropriate to the transaction, right? Your job nope. is to do the best job for them and to help them accomplish their real estate goals, period. That's it. Yeah, but it is fascinating, too, and you and I have been sort of cut, almost caught in the spider web a few times, 
where people, you know, we have this podcast is a big audience. You said we speak to hundreds of people. You were referring to your private coaching coaching clients. clients, I know. But the truth is, Julie, we speak to tens of thousands of people because this podcast and all of our other podcasts and our book. I mean, our book Mm -hmm. came out an audio uh, book last week. I haven't checked on sales, but I know Mm -hmm. it's selling really well. Mm -hmm. You know, so we speak to. I don't even know how many people, really. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, let's not think about it. It'll make me nervous. Right. (laughs) Time to go. (laughs) Well, but the reality of it is, is that why is it that so many people are listening to us? Now, some of them, like, they might be listening to us because they assume that we're in alignment with their value set. And maybe we are. Maybe we're not. We're never going to talk about it. You guys watch. But the reason you guys listen to us is because we make you, hopefully, we educate you, we motivate you, and that causes you to get into action. We are... Um, I think that we've been in this industry and we've become, um, you know, what we've become, thankfully, from all of you guys listening to what we have to say, because what we have to say helps you. That's why. And so if our value set wasn't in alignment with you, like if you had these a completely different set of, you know, beliefs about it just doesn't even matter what I don't even want to mention any of these things because some of you guys might get triggered, honestly. But if we didn't have the same, if we weren't falling in the same end of whatever spectrum it was as you, and you thought that was the most important thing, I will not listen to Tim and Julie unless they carry this particular flag, right? Um, Or they, you know, basically come out for this or against this. I will not listen to them. Well, then you're hurting yourself because maybe even though we weren't politically or socially aligned, maybe the reality of it is, is what we had to have, what we had to say, what you could have learned from us would have been something that could have had a profound effect on your business or your personal life. Don't you right. think that's... Regardless of whatever your stance is on whatever you're hanging your hat on. Yeah. What I... it does, I, the, the thing that uh, I don't like about it is it causes people to shut their minds to the rest of it. You know, it used to be that you could have conflicting views about this, but not about that, still have an actual conversation and learn from each other. But now people are like either all in or not in, and, and you have to accept like the whole platform of whatever the issue is. And I just think that's very closed-minded thinking. So the move is, if you really want to truly be of service to other people, even though this does seem on on the surface is counterintuitive, the real answer, guys, is to absolutely positively not participate in any of it. Um, just rise above it, and then just focus on what your really yeah. highest and truest purpose on this planet is to be is to be of service to you know to as many people as you can, and the, and for you to obtain ultimately freedom, freedom. What then only can come from you being financially free, and the financial freedom is what you should all be striving for. If you guys want to look for something that's going to motivate you long term, how about this? Maybe one day, very soon, sooner than you might think, you're going to be able to wake up and you're never going to be dependent on earning money. Your your life is not going to be about doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Your life is going to be about doing what you want to do when the hell you want to do it at, <laughs> at whatever level you choose, right? That's right. That's something that all of you could obtain in the next 20, 24 to 36 months, if not sooner. Listen to our past podcasts. Read our book, right? Well, this, that is the subtitle of the book. Yeah, right? <laughs> so Exactly. But do yeah. focus in on that and don't give up on that and don't believe that you can't obtain it because you can. Now, with that in mind, can I tell you what else I'm thinking about? Sure. So I had probably, I don't know, half dozen high level, you know, coaching calls mm-hmm. this week where people have, um, you know, they owe money from, for taxes from last year. Mm-hmm. Ooh, this is, a, now we're talking about another thing that's going to give people, mm-hmm. you know, right, we, right. Did, we went from talking about, you know, dancing on the edges of talking about the highly, you know, contestable yeah. social whatever. And now we're meandering into taxes. These, this definitely is not going to be a relaxing podcast for most <laughs> listeners, but guys, it's worth it's listening reality, to. reality though. Right. So I had a lot of pod or a lot of podcast coaching clients and these are coaching clients that are all, you know, high up on the food chain. Right. And, uh, they were lamenting having to pay their tax bill. Most of which had, um, you know, basically were, they paid most of their taxes off for last year, but all of them still had some lingering taxes, which were due in July or whatever. And so they had um, these, you know, one of them had a tax bill that or a tax check he had to write for, I think it was $350,000. And Ouch. he had already paid what he thought was all of his taxes from last Ugh. year. He just didn't pay, pay the uh, fourth quarter. That's yeah, this bad. guy obviously earns a lot of money. Yeah. So, um, it, so I started talking to him about taxes and I started talking to him about all these other types of things that are, you know, going to affect his year. Well, he fortunately is having a fantastic year this year, but there are a lot of agents out there that aren't going to have the money to pay their taxes because their years are not as good as they were last year. Yep. And so you're going to see a lot of agents that are going to be basically holding their heads, you know, in shame because they couldn't pay their tax bills. And a lot of agents listing right now and brokers listing right now, they're ill prepared for that. 
Well, this is one of the reasons why we advise them to take the PPP money and the EIDL money and the unemployment and, you know, kind of have a backup plan. And I, you know, the other thing that really stinks is in addition to your normal income taxes, a lot of the cities are also looking at well, raising property tax. So let's, let's talk about it. that. Yeah. So, so Julie, so this is the reason that you guys can hate on Julie today because <laughs> she wanted to talk more about taxes. I was going to talk about something like puppies and kittens and children or uh-huh. something. Sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. No, but, no, but seriously, the tax <laughs> yeah. conversation is very, is interesting because I got to studying it and you know, I shared mm-hmm. some articles with you. There's a lot of, all right, so uh, um, this is not political. Don't throw me in under one, you know, bus or the other. Um, the Biden um, folks came out with what they are proposing. I guess it's the talking points of what they're proposing with regards to the taxes for the, um, you know, federal taxes. And uh, some of it was meh. Others, other bits of it, shocking. One of which is that looks like they're putting 1031s for real estate. 10, 1031 uh, tax exchanges might be on the chopping block. Yeah. Now, many of you guys don't know what a 1031 is. A 1031 is simply where you take, if you're an investor or a flipper, there's a lot of people listening that have you know, been flipping houses. And what they do is they'll, you, you, know, you flip your first one for $150,000. You put 50 in it. You sell it for you know, 250. You made 50 grand. And then you flip that $50,000 profit into the next house. And then, then you keep on doing that, right? And then you keep on pushing back the taxes. And then you don't have to necessarily ever pay the taxes. You know, it could be left to your estate. And then it passes through probate, depending on your state and all the rest of it. But the moral of the story is, is that you can use 1031s to push your taxes back and never have to pay income taxes on um, that income, you know, that hypothetical income. Even though you didn't receive the income, you pushed it to the next property. You didn't actually have the money to spend on, you know, coffee makers or whatever, new shoes. You basically push the, that all the money, from that 50 you made in that first one to the next one, and then you keep yeah, on doing it. Yeah, you're delaying the tax burden. Basically. Well, it looks like they're going to try to make that be a point of contention and make the 1031 tax exchange go away. And so you're going to have to pay taxes on every house you flip, which is going to cause you to have gains. You know, Obviously, you're then going to make that 50 grand, depending on what tax bracket you're in, depending on what's, you know, uh, where you live in the country, you might then lose a third of it or maybe even a half of it to taxes. Well, how many people are going to flip houses if basically they have to they they have to start paying taxes on that gain and they can't 1031 it? What's that going to do to real estate sales? So all these unintended consequences. And then Julie just touched on something too. We've been paying very close attention to and the Biden tax thing also increases the top income bra- uh, income tax bracket. Um, and th- all these are just proposals at this point. Obviously, he's not even the president, you know. But these are just the types of things they're talking about doing. But it does appear, and this is. You know, it's crazy to say, but it doesn't it, – they're not going to roll back the Trump tax cuts on the highest tax bracket. It looks to me, from what I read and what I heard other people commenting on, they're actually going to make the top tax bracket start with a four. So in other words, you're – you know, if you're earning whatever they deem to be the top tax bracket, there's a high probability that the that your highest portion of your income is going to be – 40% of it is going to go to federal taxes. Yeah, not to mention your state taxes, too. Well, okay, so let's start drilling down. Here's the other series of articles Julie and I started reading. And these are the un- all the things that you guys need to be thinking about and preparing for. It absolutely appears that a lot of these states, um, and even municipalities, but states primarily, are going to be raising property taxes. Now, you know, Julie and I, it was uh, I forget where the article was from, but there are all these state governors and all these politicians in your states are all saying, you know what, we're going to have a shortfall. And the only lever we really can, because we can't increase sales tax receipts because we can't make people spend more money because that's a voluntary tax, right? Well, and some businesses aren't even open for you to spend money at. Right. right so the only right thing, now. only other mechanism we have is to go after sale or property taxes. So some of these states are, and Julie and I are still researching this, but some of these states are talking about raising property taxes substantially. Julie and I were debating whether or not we read this quote from... Um, uh, was it, I think it was Zero Hedge, wasn't it? No, no, no. I'm talking Hedge about the, the, the okay. uh, Texas, right? Mm. So the, the, the what mayor of Dallas or whatever it was said, we again, Julie and I are debating this. We, we're not sure whether he was saying that property taxes will go up by 8%. Or whether or not the tax current tax rate will go up by eight percent. I think he said that the tax rate um, could go up by eight percent, which would make the ta- property taxes in Dallas. I'm only guessing to be at ten percent or above. And I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right. Julie's pretty sure she's right. You want right. to kill the housing market off? You do that. Well, I mean, I mean, you know. So we're 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 researching all this. But if any of you guys have any insight on that, please text me five one two seven five eight zero two zero six. 
Um, and then we were reading in other states, they're also talking about, you know, Illinois, certainly. You're, again, so all these little local, you, you have your your local taxes are levied by your, you know, local, you know, tax authority, uh, authority and depending on how, how that shakes out. So in like, for example, when Julie and I lived in um, just north of Austin in Georgetown, our property taxes, what were our property taxes per year? 18 grand? 22 22 grand crap and the house was the house was appraised or was assessed at how much 850 900 no no it wasn't oh was it assessed that high yeah okay well i mean there's an equation that goes with it but basically that's what wasn't yeah but 75 percent of what basically the closer if you figure a million dollar house it's probably going to be about 23 24 thousand a yeah. year so if it's half you cut it by half but that's still crazy yeah so that's what's going to be most likely happening and, and that's you know texas isn't even the worst i've had coaching no. clients in upstate new york where it's like I, I remember I had a client that had a, a two million dollar listing, and the taxes were like over fifty grand a year. That house ended up selling for a million, fifty percent less. And she had that listing; it was the record that I can remember. It was White Plains, New York. She had it for eight years, and the constant objection was the taxes, which right. is not an. You, there is no objection handler for that. And I asked her, "Is there a way that you can argue it with the auditor?" And she said, "No, because everybody's in the same situation. There's no comp saying that it shouldn't be that." Right. And so eventually price reduction prevailed. Right. And yeah, well, then the seller inevitably lost a bunch of money because they probably bought it before the, ta- the property taxes were yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys in California, you're going to be looking at, what was it, Prop, what's that Prop? That 13, makes, I think. Prop 13, yeah, it is Prop 13. Prop 13, it looks to me, based on, you guys read this yourselves, if you're in California, probably 40% of you listening to us are. We have a huge amount of clients in California. Go and listen uh, and read what's the local, what your local yokel tax guys are talking about doing for your um, property taxes. It looks like they're going to be raising it, and at the same time, they're going to start limiting what you can do with Prop uh, with uh, Prop 13. And and with Prop 13, is effectively, is it locked in a, a a tax rate, an artificially low tax rate, uh, depending on when Prop 13 was put in. Your, I think, if I understand it correctly. Uh, if you're, they locked your property taxes in at whatever the rate was, and then the only people that suffered from the higher property taxes were the people that, that bought new real estate after Prop 13. But it looks like they're going to say, you know what, we've given those people enough of a break. We're going to start, you know, reducing that too. And yeah. so why are why are all these taxes going up? The taxes are going up because all these cities and states have all got these budgets, and these budgets have essentially pre-spent and pre-committed. The money predicated on, you know, sales tax receipts and property taxes. So they last year, year before, whenever they did their budgets, they said, well, we expect to have this much money coming in. Boom, pandemic happens. And all these cities and states, they're all like, holy crap, we have all these things we've committed to pay for. And you know what politicians don't aren't very good at doing? They aren't very good at saying, well, we're not going to spend the money. We're just going to tax you more. We're still going to do this. We're still going to do that. We've already basically done all these other things. So we're going to ultimately pass this expense and our inability or unwillingness to essentially, you know, go back and maybe modify how we're going to spend, we're going to actually make it so we're going to pass that expense on um, to homeowners, to property owners. Um, so, you know, there's a couple interesting little interesting headwinds that we all need to be paying attention to politically because it does matter. It will have an effect on your real estate market. We can continue to drill down on taxes, but I've also been reading that, like, if you live in California. Again, I only know this because I have like so many great coaching clients out there, Julie and I both, mm-hmm. private ones, right? So when we use the uh, singular pronouns and I say I have, it's because these are personal clients I've had, some of them for years, and we have, those are the ones that are in our um, premier coaching program, which is the program where we have thousands of agents from all over the country, Canada, we're starting to pick them up in Australia and in Europe, and it's, it's amazing. But I have private coaching clients out there, Julie, who have... Uh, they're going to be, they're already in the highest tax bracket. Mm-hmm. So there's a high probability that they're going to be paying more in federal taxes and they're paying, just listen to all this, okay? Mm-hmm. And they're paying uh, 13% in state taxes to California. Yep. And now their property taxes are going up. That doesn't include sales taxes, I which know. is whatever it is, 8%. Mm-hmm. That doesn't include, you know, the sort of a hidden all taxes the like the taxes on gasoline and the taxes on all that. Mm-hmm. And so I calculated it out. And, well, actually, the agent had done it already prior to the coaching call. The agent figured that if all these tax schemes get enacted, that they're going to be paying something like 64% of their income to taxes when you factor it all That's in. That's worse than Canada. Yeah. But isn't that amazing? I know. I know. And, you know, along with a lot of that, I bet you're also going to see some other little sneaky taxes like transfer taxes and, you know, things that are added on, municipality taxes. And, you know, I mean, 
but, and, and part of this is because it's so unpopular to cancel some of the services that they've already committed to, you know, because that'll be politicized. Right. And because they want to get reelected and it's all intertwined. Well, but so you, you're, you just said two things. You said something a second ago, too, which got my mind spinning. And I didn't know if I wanted to bring it up, but let's just keep on picking at this scab. It's fun. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So where are the tax? So first of all, transfer taxes, a transfer tax. And they do this a lot on the East Coast. They do it in California, too. If you're not a a resident of California, a transfer tax is a tax that they charge on the real estate transaction. In addition to all the normal fees and expenses and commissions and whatnot. So if you are, I think it's New York is most famous for doing this. They call it in London. They call it a mansion tax. They try to politicize it so right. that the you know majority of the voters will say, oh, it's you know just taking Honest money the from rich. the rich, the rich people. They're yeah. the ones, yeah. Until basically they're realizing that they're going to have to pay it too, and then it's maybe not such a good you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> whatever. But so the the transfer taxes. That's another little uh, scheme. And then there's other little schemes too. I've heard about like um. Here in Puerto Rico, we have a what's it called? What what's the taxes when you bring something in? Oh, it, well, it's an import tax, basically. It's, but it's called but something it's, else. It, it has a nice little sort of uh, you know name that you don't even think of. Yeah. So there's taxes when you bring in if you bring in a car into Puerto Rico, uh, and it makes sense. You'll bring in like if you bring in stuff, you're going to have to pay taxes on it, right? I mean, that makes sense. But if you bring in a car that you've paid for, that you've already paid sales tax, and it's not a hybrid or an electric car, you have to excise tax. That's yes, what it is. That's it. You have to pay and what amounts to a 20% excise tax. So, And they decide what the car is worth. So if you bring in your you know, paid-off Chevrolet Suburban, which would be a horrible car here, but if you brought that in, and let's say the Puerto Rican tax authorities, and they actually use – you know, fair taxing values. They use like Kelly Blue Book or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they say it's worth twenty five grand. You got to pay essentially what it amount to thirty percent, ten percent sales tax, and a twenty percent excise tax. This isn't exactly how it works. There's other factors, but that's the essence of it. So bringing something in will cost you a non hybrid or non electric car will bring you thirty will cost you thirty percent. Which you know, obviously the answer is if you need a if you're moving to Puerto Rico, buy a car here, make sure it's a hybrid, and then you have to still pay the sales tax, but you don't have to pay the excise tax. Mm-hmm. Um, well, excise taxes and transfer taxes and all these other little taxes, you know, they're transactional taxes, which in and themselves aren't so you know, they're sort of palatable because then you only have to pay the taxes in the event that you're actually, you know, it's like a sales tax, right? You can choose not to pay the tax by choosing not to buy the whatever. But then what happens is they start taxing things like utilities. Okay, well, I didn't really see that. Then they start taxing essentially everything. Um, The other big little bucket of cash that seems to be on the radar is taxes. uh, Like right now, real estate services aren't taxed. Um, if you buy a service, like when someone buys coaching from us, there's no taxes on it because it's a service that's provided online. Well, mm-hmm. guess what? They want to basically start taxing your real estate transaction mm-hmm. in addition to the transfer tax, in addition to, you know, you guys get what I'm getting at here? Everything is on the board. Everything is considered for taxes right now because of the pandemic. Well, I need it. And they're using yeah. that as an excuse. And, and here's the pissy thing about taxes. Once they're in place, how often do you hear a temporary tax not becoming permanent? Doesn't ha- right. does not. The only place I've seen that happening was Texas, truthfully. That's true. Yep. I would see in, tax, in Texas, the politicians would have to pass some temporary tax. Maybe there was a big flood or maybe there was some kind of huge problem that happened or shortfall in something. Mm-hmm. Tax would happen. Tax would go away. I've never seen another place where that actually happened. No. I don't think so. Yeah. And then, oh, here's the other taxes that I read about too that people are talking about. A value added tax, yeah. which is basically a, essentially an excise tax. But what an interesting name. Value added tax. Like, what is the value I'm getting by paying this? I'm confused. <laughs> I know, but that's the design of it. That's that's what makes all these little taxing schemes so like almost it's yeah. it's like an old it's like a Saturday night live skit, you know? Right. Whatever it is, you think of a name that's the exact opposite of what it is to that's basically what we'll call it, so make people, people not it. pay attention to it, right? So so if aliens invade everyone and we all have to stand in line to have, you know, whatever the aliens want to do with us, you know, measured for their whatever, right? Mm-hmm. What would they call it? They wouldn't call it basically. They call it like the Alien Protection Act or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're here to destroy civilization, but we'll call it protection just so you'll vote for it yeah. well, or so pay for it. What was the other thing you, you brought up? Oh, why? Are, so where are all these taxes going? What are they actually going for, you might ask? You're thinking, well, they're going for, you know, um, you know, for, you, all the normal things. You you in your mind, if you're like Julie and I, you're saying, I'm an American. I should pay my taxes. I have a duty to pay my taxes. And you do. Wherever you live, 
you have to contribute whatever has been you know agreed upon to be the correct amount of money to pay for the things that you benefit from hypothetically the roads and the lights and the public servants and the rest of it Mm -hmm. but what you're seeing the taxes go to largely are things that would be commitments that have been made generations ago that are that those expenses are continuously passed forward and i'll give you a one that will maybe get julie giving me a raised eyebrow because her parents are school teachers a lot of pensions, school teacher pensions, are backstopped by property taxes. So if the school teacher pension has a shortfall in it to meet the obligations that were made maybe through negotiations with those teachers generations ago, and however that works, I'm not an expert at it, and there's a shortfall because, let's say, for example, the stock market goes down or, say, for example, the investments that that pension fund had made aren't doing as well, they have a backstop of being able to go to property tax um, wells and pull the money out. Now, here's a little interesting shift that I think will be fascinating to see if people actually put all these thoughts together. And this is a conversation we had yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell are we paying for with school? What are we getting? Yeah, I know. We talk about this almost every week because I think it's fascinating. I've got a new call coming up on Thursday to find out just what the answer to that is. But don't you think that's interesting ultimately? I mean, think of how much... Okay, just put this in perspective. Mm -hmm. So I am, you know... Okay, when you and I lived in Ohio and we sold real estate in Ohio... And we sold real estate, a lot of homes, and we did really well for ourselves. And I remember having a like almost panic attacks because I realized that you and I had earned zillions of dollars helping have you know sold zillions of houses, mm-hmm. you know, and yet we weren't accumulating anything. And, yeah. and normally I would said, and this is what my mind told me because you know this is what my mind told me. Well, it's because you're spending too much money. You guys are right? you know. You're, but then like I look at our household budget. We weren't no. We weren't spending well, too much money. Pretty close. I know. <laughs> we don't go. Out, we never have gone out to eat. We've never like. We're not big copious spenders. No, we're not. You know, we. we but then no, you, I think we've, by and large, lived beneath our means. But then you look at your budget. You think of your household budget. Like the oh. first thing, you need to save more money. You know, we say it to our coaching clients in one form or another. Yeah. And then you look at like, okay, what are you spending money on? Well, you do really need to be spending three hundred dollars a month at Starbucks. No, you can cut it to one hundred and fifty dollars, right? And you start going after all these lifestyle expenses. Yeah, but that's not like your client that had to write a check for three hundred fifty grand. That's okay. So you save three hundred bucks on your phone bill. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it doesn't so, quite translate. So this goes back to how that's you know so essentially feudal. And how asinine a lot of the, so, the financial planning that so many of us have had instilled in us, because we think the reason that we're not doing better financially, and that so many you know people, agents in particular, because there are, you know, there are people are struggling financially. It's not necessarily because you guys overspend. It's because you're paying freaking too much in taxes, and you don't even know it. And because you're not conscious to the fact that you've slowly, it's like the frog that slowly gets boiled, right? And that's exactly what's happening, is exactly what's happening. And it just, it's, it terrorizes me to think how many people are going to meander into this next election cycle, just, you know, blindly voting for people who are essentially going to... Tax the, the crap out of you. Yeah, the government doesn't create anything. All the government does is take from, you know, one group and give to another. That's, the government does not manufacture anything the government doesn't come out with anything they don't create anything i mean look at look at right now with the pandemic there's four competing companies that all look like they're going to create a viable what (laughs) my stupid watch just basically was listening to us the whole time taking notes to every word i said and now she's just giving me uh, the latest notes on the coronavirus pandemic seriously (laughs) look (laughs) That's a good assistant, I guess. I don't know. I know. It's I mean, kind it's, of creepy. Yeah, it is kind of creepy. But I'm just you thinking, if this thing. watch listens to me all day, and someone's that actually thing. you know, transcribing and recording everything that I say, they're going to go nuts listening to the things Absolutely. I have to do. <laughs> right? Poor thing. But, but seriously, <laughs> getting back to it, like the, you look, the government said, went to the, you know four drug makers, and you know I'm sure they have all kinds of you know, incentives put in place. Whoever comes up with it the fastest, don't worry about the expense. And you see that... They're making amazing strides to create um, an actual vaccine for this damn thing, and it's because the government has uh, the government can't make it make it themselves. The government can't actually create its own coronavirus um, vaccine. The government just basically, in this particular case, I think it's doing the right thing. It's incentivizing using tax dollars mm-hmm. the creation of something that's going to you know do some public good. 
But you, you guys all have to be very clear when you're making decisions and thinking, what are the unintended consequences for your emotional, you know, your heartstrings being pulled in one direction or the other with regards to your thinking in general? Okay, what comes after that? Well, they're going to take what you've got. They're going to take it through taxation. They're going to take it through raising your property taxes. They're going to take it. So like when Julie and I were in Columbus, Ohio, we'd sell a house. And we would then, you know, we sold between 100 and 200 houses per year for almost a decade. And if you look at like at the end of the year, well, we did it every quarter, right? And we'd have to write checks to every single city in which we sold a house in. Mm -hmm. Because every single city would require that we basically file a tax return because we earned money in that particular city. Well, that's something else that guess what? A lot of the states are starting to think about because they're saying, you know what, Tim and Julie, you guys work for Google, but you live in Puerto I Rico. Mm -hmm. So technically, you know, uh, Google's in California. So Google, because they pushed you to Puerto Rico because you're living in Puerto Rico, they're not having to pay this in the same ta taxes on you as if you'd lived in California. We feel like we're losing out. So we're going to figure out a way that you still have to pay taxes on Tim and Julie, even though they never go to California because, because they work for you as an employee, California. right? Yeah. So it's almost like an employee tax mm -hmm. kind of thing. They're going to figure out and think of all kinds of different schemes, and they're going to do it under the premise that they have to basically make up for budget shortfalls from the coronavirus, which, by the way, is definitely not going away. And, um, yeah, if you guys hear wind blowing, it's because we're outside. So Hurricane season. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's, that's the next thing. There's pelicans that just flew over. Were those pelicans? No, those were parrots. Green parrots. Yeah, green parrots. So just, you guys, just don't be lulled into complacency and don't be manipulated through your emotions to, into think, to thinking that you have to fall lockstep with you know, whatever sorts of virtue signaling that you're kind of, you know, drowning out in, I think, maybe more logical, cohesive thinking on either side of the spectrum. Just have your eyes open and understand the ramifications that you make decisions when you're saying what you're saying, when you're doing what you're doing or not doing what you should be doing. And then you make decisions when you pass that, you know, your maybe ill-conceived sets of beliefs off to other people. They then basically perpetuate that type of thinking, and the next thing you know, you're paying 64% of your income well, in taxes. But, but why is that? It's because you hang your hat on a particular, say, social issue that you right. believe wholeheartedly in, and that's your thing. But along with that comes all of the overlay of the taxes and the other issues. Yep. So that's why, you know, I, I mean, you really have to study what you're actually signing up for or decide to opt out of it. Yeah, basically, just decide to opt out of it. But, you you know, the way you ultimately you win right now at this day and age, if you're even thinking in terms of winning and losing, is you become rich. And rich is where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. Every dominant thought in your head, if you find yourself finding that very thing I just said offensive, it's because you're being manipulated into essentially giving up your free will in service to something that supposedly is going to take care of you or cure an ill or a social ill that may or may not exist. But the way you can choose to basically be in control of your time, energy, and thoughts is ultimately to be rich where your money works for you. You no longer have to work for your money. And our definition of rich is? That, what yeah. you just said. Yeah. So if you had, for example, a monthly overhead of 5000 or 10000 or 15000 if you had money coming in that is going to cover your personal monthly overhead, in other words, you, did not ever, you didn't have to worry anymore about where your next paycheck was going to come from, that would give you... Uh, freedom from the tyranny of lack, freedom from the tyranny of worrying about whether or not, like how many of you guys believe what you believe? Julie's got these great clients in Long Beach. And you want, you, can you want to talk about them without using their names? Don't use their names. Well, I'm not going to use their names. How they're having a bit of a... Well, I mean, they to be fair, where they live is definitely... Well, that's my point though. You know, they're surrounded by a certain way of thinking, shall we say. Uh, but you know... The way it manifests for them is some of this crap they've had to deal with with their, quote, team members' beliefs and, and how the, those people who have, by the way, since become, so we say, unemployed, not necessarily because of their beliefs, but because of the virus, we don't need as many people on the team. But, because, you know, that they felt it was appropriate, that they felt it was, um, that they were confident to say, no, I won't do that because it's against my political beliefs was like it has nothing to do with that I w i'm asking you to go deliver it was like a, a pop by hand sanitizer thing that somehow that this was insensitive and like that was just issue after issue 
that is all socially based, not even remotely business based. And it caused this these this couple that I coached there to question their, they both separately said, maybe I'm not as liberal as I think because I'm having to deal with this. And how is this? Like their business brain was in conflict with their social brain. On the liberal side of the spectrum, what's interesting is there's an absolute upheaval that's happening because there's a there's a far, far left, um, you know, and we've seen, I've seen this in coaching clients. I've seen this in brokerages, right? Mm-hmm. I've seen this in, um, fortunately, I don't see a lot with our neighbors, but a lot of people are being pulled in these directions, not realizing, and, and they're doing it out of, you know, fear of, uh, catching the you know the social wrath of the people right. that would otherwise I mean they're calling it the cancel culture they're calling it whatever they're calling it it's fascinating yeah. you're seeing this rift that's happening primarily on the liberal side and I guess if I were to categorize I mean I'm not being political but if you and I are definitely not one way or the other we're definitely I would say you know we're yeah. I say we're socially liberal but financially conservative yeah yeah I that's, think that's accurate right and so if you look at for example on the liberal side of things that the liberal side of things is not what it's not your mom and dad is Liber, uh, Democratic yep. Party it's being really pulled away and apart by this really far very fascinating historically to watch truthfully left leaning side of arguments and it, it's not something like I was I had again I had somebody this is about two weeks ago and one of our coaching clients actually. Um, <laughs> squelched it. But I had somebody who was trying to, we, we were on a, a Zoom meeting and people were asking questions. This was, you know, maybe a month ago and people were asking, agents were asking questions about how they should be reacting and interacting with people that were so emotionally distraught because of the things that were happening socially. And you guys know our stance and that's what we told them. And then we had somebody who was vocally, emotionally, uh, first in words, I first in just a chat and then in words, trying to basically um, pressure us to take a stance that was in, went in alignment with her stance. And whether our alignment was with her stance or not, we were not going to say anything. Well, because it's not appropriate to have a stance. It's not even appropriate to have that conversation on, our, on no, a Zoom go meeting. Go to our house. Good right? Lord. <laughs> go take a listing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? But that was the thing. It's like oh, they yeah, wanted yeah. to mix it up with us and oh, make no. and try to get other people who maybe had the same belief structure to start putting pressure on us and to start in like, fortunately, a lot of the people that were there, they were long time, you know, listeners and, and they understood where we were coming from that you can't be of service to people if you have essentially put yourself in a position where you have pigeonholed yourself in a particular corner of a particular social well, argument. Because it never ends, right? Right. I mean, if you have so many things that it's fine to have passion about things, but know where the place for it is. Because if you have so many rules that your friends or your your clients have to follow and be in alignment with. What you're doing is you're shrinking your world to the point where nobody will actually want to do business with you. Well, we are sitting over, um, Julie and I, you know, we live in Puerto Rico and there's a Ritz Carlton property and when there's a near us, there's a, well, there's beautiful, it's gorgeous. It's crazy. I can't believe considering where Julie and I came from, we live here. But <laughs> anyway, so we're sitting over having a, you know, espresso or something and we're, uh, there's this nice couple that was, you know, we can, we can sense the tourists, and the, so there were tourists. They're staring at the hotel. Mm-hmm. Do you guys hear that? Ugh. That is a random pop-up party here in Puerto Rico. That's a normal That's thing. A street party going by. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so we we had um, we were having this conversation, and um, you know, being very polite. <laughs> Just, you know, Julie and I yep. are not going to certainly talk about anything political well, or whatever. Was earthquake week, I think you're. Yeah, this calling. was before the pandemic. Yeah, it this was, was earlier earthquake. this year. Yeah. They were celebrating their anniversary, I remember now. Mm -hmm. So we get to talking to them, and guess what she does for a living? That's right, she's a real estate broker, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. We didn't know. Maybe we sniffed them out. (laughs) We're drawn to them magnetically. (laughs) And he owned a plumbing business. And she, without, and they lived in Washington, D.C., and she, without batting an eye, didn't just start virtue signaling. She started beating us with a verbal bat about her beliefs about, it. you know, again, I'm not going to be pulled into it. But it's like she didn't stop talking. Her husband kept on reading the newspaper. He was so used to her basically spouting off. And, and then and then we said, you know, we told her who we were and she knew who we were. And then she kind of like, it was funny, her behavior changed. And then I said to her, I said, well, can I just be direct with you? Which if I ever ask you that question, the best <laughs> answer is no. <laughs> Early warning sign. So, so, so remember, Julie and I, Julie's very polite. She's sitting there, you know, acting like she cares what this lady is, you know, spouting off about. And then I ask her, why do you think, I don't remember exactly what I said. I said, why do you think that I think 
what you're saying. Why do you think I share those beliefs? Why do you think that it's appropriate to talk to Julie and I as we could have hypothetically been prospective real estate clients? You didn't know who we were. You yeah. thought we were just people sitting having coffee. Why do you think we thought what you thought? And she was she was at first offended and then she listened because she didn't realize what she was doing. She actually was subconsciously beating this freaking drum and beating all of us along right right along with it, including her poor husband. <laughs> yeah, who did look like he about had it. Yeah, but he was really he was glad. trying to relax. Did you do you remember when I said that? He was but like he, he put his paper down and he goes he goes something like, "Are you listening?" to right. his wife. I know. You know, then then she gave well, him a look. He knows. Then she gave him a look and he went back to his paper. Yeah. <laughs> But I think your point is that how many people make those assumptions and it's become so acceptable to just, you know, basically verbally, as you said, beat the drum without even asking. See, this this is against our coaching ethos because our whole, like, if you look at our presentations, we ask you, we coach you to ask questions first so that you can take somebody's temperature and then you can react versus assuming that they better come along with you and, you know, or that they absolutely automatically believe what you believe. But even then, I, even I after you do take their nuts. temperature, there's no sense in even talking about things that are going to be like that. There's no sense in it. No, but see, your your example of our breakfast there was she, she it didn't even occur to her that it, somebody could have a different thought. Yeah, exactly she, she right. just like, you know. Well, it's because she lives in, so, so in, I, if I'm now remembering the rest of the conversation. Yeah. We were talking about like. She was she was being coachable, and you and I started both talking to her, and we kind of leaned into the conversation more, whereas before you and I were just trying to figure out – like I got – honestly, I got sick of just hearing her rant unchecked and when she knew who we were, and I was – I felt then obligated to put something out, which is probably my ego, but nonetheless – after that, we had for not very long, but we had a fairly meaningful conversation. And I and she yeah. started saying that she was so used to everyone around her That's in right. her I community. Yeah, you remember that? Having the same sets of beliefs that she didn't stop herself to be introspective about how inappropriate it is really to have that be the common conversation. So the common conversation yeah. amongst her friends and her peers was to be of that political ilk. And um, it's like my Long Beach girls. And then her husband told me, uh, who did not share her beliefs, though he did not, you know, put it in her face. It was obvious that he didn't. He then said, where they live, you have to act yeah. like that and talk like that and think like that for for her to get real estate deals. And so what she had done, basically, she, is had she adopted it. She adopted it. Mm-hmm. She, you know, but and, but she also believed that, that was the only way she had to be. What she didn't realize in Washington, D.C., I'm sure there's an equal number of people that are on this side of the political you know, fence versus the other. Mm-hmm. And by her essentially piling on with one side, she was alienating the other side where she could have been doing business with both sides. Yeah, it's like the political version of personality styles. Yeah, you know? versatility. I mean, where agents say, well, you know, I only work with people that I hit it off with. Well, that's become a political thing, too. It's not just a, know. are you direct or indirect? Are you an extrovert or introvert? It's which side do you fall on? And I just think it's it's so uh, magnifying, limiting, you know, maybe limiting beliefs. or. What, I, are, what are the unintended know. consequences of being Your like board that? gets smaller and You're smaller and smaller. smaller. Right. And because you never- because it, it, it affects everything. Like, you know, are your kids not apl- allowed to play with those kids because, yep. you know, the parents don't believe what you believe? I mean, it, it just is never ending. But go back to the conversation we just had about, um, like, maybe you're listening right now and you're saying, I am, you know, and maybe you're the, you know, biggest socialist wannabe and you're absolutely positively, not just you know, liberal, you're Adamant. What, whatever. Okay. That's your side of the thing. Okay. Have you ever stopped? And the same goes for people like are super conservative. Have you ever gone to stop and think about, no, most people don't. They just continue to say, the way I believe is the way I believe is the way I'm always going to believe. Well, let's look at, for example, we we're just talking about taxes. If you live in an area where, like, for example, you know, California, and you're surrounded by these sort of this echo chamber of everyone saying and doing the same thing, and a politician comes along and says, we're going to redistribute and we're going to do this, the other thing, and we're going to start the other thing and the, this thing. And because you're caught in this echo chamber, you say, well, hell yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to vote for that person. And then you start realizing that you are working harder than you worked before and you're keeping less and you're actually creating more or less financial independence, making it so that you are actually degrading the quality of life you have because now you're being forced to do things you wouldn't have otherwise wanted to do for as long as you've otherwise wanted to do mm-hmm. them. And I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about taxes, frankly. So with this time next year, if we wake up and there's, um, you know, politicians and tax laws that have been passed, 
and you're living in a place and you're going you're wondering well holy snot i worked my butt off to actually improve my transactions improve my skill set but the amount of money that i've saved is actually less than what it was the previous year where maybe my business was even down right maybe this year is going to be your best savings year next year your business increases by 50 percent you listen to us and you understand how to do short sales and distress and you're basically king of the hill of that market and then you go and you look at, you know, you're meeting with your accountant. And I remember when we did this in Columbus, Ohio, you know, mm-hmm. you meet with your accountant and the and accountant says, well, here's the deal. You are definitely selling more units. Congratulations. You're doing a great job. You've definitely, you know, you've, you're dispersing, you, you've buried the sources of business. You've improved as an entrepreneur. But here's the deal. You're actually making less net income because these are the additional 10 checks you have to write to taxes. And you're like, oh, I didn't even remember saying voting for those things. Well, you did. You yeah. just didn't realize you did. And now because there's these shortfalls and these local mostly governments and state governments are going to have to make up for the amount of money that they don't have because they're not willing to just decide not to spend the money, they're going to go and they're going to tax you even more. And you're going to even now then again wake up maybe a year from now and realize, holy crap, where did all my money go? What am I doing this for? Why am I in business? What? Are, what? Are, so now you're asking yourself, okay, Tim, I get it. Yeah. Well, and then it goes on from there because now you owe penalties and you, it's like you're getting taxed on your taxes that you didn't pay. Then you go have a good year and you owe again. I mean, how many agents have we known over the years where they just cannot get out from under it? Right. And you yeah. live in a place where in order for you to run your business there, like our you know broker friend and her husband, the plumber, they live in a place in Washington, D.C., where his business is rooted and her business is rooted. And they can't really leave because if they leave, they're going to lose their income source. And they probably don't have they're probably not rich where their money works for them. They don't you know, no longer have to work for the money. So they're dependent on those that transactional income in that particular geographic area. And now they're stuck And that stuckedness is what is going to those the people that are stuck are the people ultimately which are going to lose their sense of freedom the fastest and like for i was uh, we shared on this actually sunday podcast an, an interesting article that i read mm-hmm. people like live in manhattan right yeah and, and people are like i'm paying all this money in, like a, a, a dual a, it was an article it was about a, a working couple with like one kid or two kids living in Manhattan and they have they're making a million dollars per year. Now you guys are saying those sons of bitches they should be able to make the ends meet. Well then they showed what their actual budget was and they were not spending hardly any money on, you know, Neiman Marcus and And they you know, didn't live in a fancy place either. They didn't even own a car. Right. Okay. Right. So they weren't living in a fancy place. They were living in like an eighteen no, it was like a yeah, eighteen hundred square foot three bedroom house, mm-hmm. not in a posh area of town. It wasn't a dorman building. Something normal. Um, something normal. Because they had, you know, kids they you know sure. wanted to be close to a park and but they are paying for private schools the property taxes the income taxes from the state the income taxes from federal yeah. and then they showed basically and everything there was you know expensive and they showed what the amount of money that these people are actually netting and in essence the entire income from one of the working spouses was going just to pay the taxes majority of mm-hmm. which wouldn't have had to be paid had they lived in say for example florida yeah. And they're saying like I they this person was saying I went to school I took out student loans I wanted to be in the financial industry same with my wife or maybe it was the wife's perspective same with my husband and now we are realizing and we thought we had to live here to have these opportunities and now we're realizing that they're waking up and realizing we feel like we were lied to yeah I mean I think we're going to see more and more stories like that with people moving to less taxed states that still have the amenities that they're looking for, especially right. now that the whole world has become comfortable zooming on pretty much everything. Yep. And in addition to that, you have a lot of people who are becoming less dependent on a particular school district because maybe the kids are being, um, you know, distance learning or homeschool. So I think that I was thinking about this yesterday, that the factors that we've all been used to for decades, driving housing have changed, you know, people's totally. decision making factors, both geographically, financially. I mean, I had one of our coaches tell me that, you know, she was thinking about before the next uh, influx of what's going to hit, I mean, for sure, Las Vegas, maybe it's time for her to downsize before she has to have her house. Hell yeah, it is. This is the best time. And and she would not have normally been moving at this point. This is, yeah, this is the best time probably in the next, who knows how long, at least five years to sell your house. Yeah. No doubt. So it's just interesting times. You're right? nuts. If you got if you're thinking about downsizing guys, downsize now. Cash out now. Absolutely. And then just if you know, maybe you don't have a place to go, go and rent someplace. But so why are we telling you this? Are Tim Tim and Julie anti taxes? No, we're anti not paying your taxes. We're anti 
uh, overpaying your taxes. Your job is to pay the taxes that are due. Your job is also to put yourself in a the most tax advan- advantageous place that you possibly can. People are not dumb. People are not going to stay in places where they're essentially having um, a third, if not a half, if not 64% of their income go to taxes. They're going to move. I was remembering when we lived in Columbus, weren't you friends with a guy that had like a... Um it's like a landscaping company by the summer and a snow removal in the winter. And somehow he had figured out that ad- when he no, no, hit no, a it certain... It was an accountancy. I know who you're talking about. Like they hit a certain um, it was an number. Accountancy. And it actually was diminishing returns for every dollar earned over that. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I was actually thinking about that exact guy. And I, it, you're not no, remember. You're, I'll, I'll put color on it because it, it's it interesting. It was your... Yeah, I remember. It was before real estate. It yeah. was like... It was... Julie and I had a car cleaning and detailing yeah, business when we were in college. And this guy was a car cleaning and detailing customer. And our normal car cleaning and detailing customers, we would service them once per month. And he would only use us for half the year, up until about May usually. And I remember talking to him. He was a great customer, always, you know, just wonderful. Two cars, you know, perfect. Yeah. And one of them was a really nice Porsche 944, you know. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so he would have us, you know, work on his cars, always very grateful, always send us referrals and everything. But he'd only use us for five or six months of the year. And I remember asking him why. And he said, because in, this was back in the 90s. And he said, and I'll never forget this. Obviously, I'm telling you the story like I just experienced it yesterday. He said, because of the nature of the amount of money that I earn in the first half of the year th- through my accountancy, that there's no point in me working the second half of the year because the percent that I'm going to be paying between the state of Ohio and federal taxes and city taxes, there's no point in me actually working because I'm going to be working. I think at the time, I don't remember the exact number. I'm going to kind of make it up. But he, I think he said he was only going to make like 25 cents or 27 cents on the dollar. Because the rest of it would be. Right. Yeah, and so, so he said to himself, I'd rather not work and take some downtime and then, you know, put things back into full swing at the start of the year. I've had real estate coaching clients do the same thing mm-hmm. for different reasons, mostly. Yeah, some, some, sometimes reasons. the conversation is, why is the second spouse working to pay for childcare when if you didn't do that and you stayed home, you also would lower your tax bracket and also save additional money? You know, I, I think to your point, we're not saying, you know, screw taxes, don't pay your taxes, nothing no. like that. What we're saying is- We're not Ann Carter. Ann, what's Ann Ann, Ann, Ann Carter? Oh. No. And not anarchists. Thank you. Damn, why could I not say that? <laughs> Too much caffeine? I get stuck on the stupidest words. <laughs> it's I always do. three or four syllable ones. But anyway. Hey. Um, it's okay. Onomatopoeia. What's that okay. mean? You tell me. I know what onomatopoeia is. Okay. Like, it's like fuzzy. Some, a word that sounds like what right, it is. Now like I'm crunchy. Thre- now I'm going to throw down the big words That's just good. to prove you wrong. I was just teasing. Don't take it personally. Anyway. Uh, so I forget mean. what I was going to say now. Yeah, see how I distracted you? You did. You're talking about we're talking about the accountant basically and the taxes and how people oh, are. Oh, so we're to... not we're not anarchists, we're not anti taxes. Right. It's not that. It's that we're pro know what your options are and change what you're doing if you have the ability to do so. Because and your customers are. Your market is doing absolutely. this. That's the reason we're talking about this. And we're maybe not... it's not moving geographically, maybe it is. Maybe it's, you know, how both spouses are working and reporting that income and, and calculating. Maybe, you know, there's other ways for you to be investing. But the point is, don't just assume that just doing what you're supposed to be doing from your paycheck and what your accountant says is the only way. You have options. Right. Your accountant's job is to fill out the forms and, and have you pay. Right. It's not as to give you financial adv- advice. Trust me, Julie, and I made that mistake. I have coaching through. clients that are in real estate and their accountants. And I can tell you for sure, they are anxious to just crank it out and get it over with because they've got stacks they of They get paid when the tax return is done. They don't get paid for giving you financial and, advice. And they're administrators, basically. U- ultimately, the best financial advice you're going to get is by listening to other people and then essentially putting your own plan together. If you don't do it that way, you're always going to be broke. Now, again, we are not trying to tell you not to pay taxes. We're not telling you taxes are, you know, they're necessary. But what they're going to be, what they should be happening and what is not not happening, but what will be happening are the nature of what taxes are being charged and for what they're being paid for, the the sort of uh, existing social structure, dogma, paradigm about you know public schools and about all these things. They need to be reviewed and discussed because the fact is, is that guess what? It turns out a hybrid approach between online education and and then some sort of you know in-person socialization is a hell of a lot better and a hell of a lot less expensive. You know we, you know you guys, if you're listening for the first time, how and you have children, how much? Well, here's a fun fact. Did I tell you this. Mm-mm. 
we've discussed this before. Mm-hmm. They sort of run this story every year, but it's, you know, whoever yeah. the they is, but it's interesting. The average person working for somebody at a company uh-huh. only works productively for two and a half hours I saw a that. day. Yep. Yeah. Isn't that hilarious? Well, then here's the secondary question. When you send your kid to school, Julie Harris, mm-hmm. when Zoe, when Zoe mm-hmm. goes to first grade, right, and she's in first grade, how much actual productive mm-hmm. learning time? Maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, nothing. The rest of it is trying to get them to calm down, to be quiet, to take, then they have to go get to in recess line. and do it all over right. again. It's, it's, and, and what are they, what is that? It's just basically child care. And why well, is that in place? Why is, why so is, two people can work. That's right. That's it. So these are the types of structures that you start saying, well, you know what? Like, we have some friends that are moving to Puerto Rico, and they're asking about the schools, and we are telling them about the the different options. And they said, well, what if we just homeschool? And and I said to them what I, you know, have been saying to Julie, well, well, that probably makes the most sense to homeschool, because A, you spend the, you save the money, but you also, you you save the the ridiculous amount of hassle. Well, there's also, you know, the virus exposure that hasn't gone away yet. No. There's that. So I, I think it's interesting that a lot of our newest coaching clients are uh, teachers that are not interested in going well, back. Well, talk about that. You know, teachers, we have uh, uh, even first responders, just like police that are, but a lot of teachers who love teaching, but they've looked at what the new protocols are and they themselves, you know, don't want to have that kind of and exposure. Cops. And firefighters. And, you know, yep. it's, it's interesting what the social unrest and the virus are uh, causing Lots and lots of different types of movement. I wouldn't want to be a cop right now. No. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a cop. I know. But I wouldn't want to be a cop. No way. It's, it's, too, it's ridiculous. Are crazy. It depends where in the country you are. But for, for the sure. most part, no thank you. But yeah. so these are the these conversations, they are the types of interesting things that happen, unintended consequences that happen from a whole bunch of different reasons. Well, that was a really pretty bird. <laughs> and those types of conversations are the things that you guys just need to be aware of because if you're not – What's going to happen is you're going to be caught by surprise. And if you're caught by surprise financially and it's in a recession, at the same time you're seeing a big migration trend outside of the area that you've overinvested yourself for whatever your business is, being a plumber or a real estate broker, then you're going to basically be caught screwed because your business is going to start to go in the wrong direction. All the while, your taxes, your taxes are definitely going in the wrong direction. And how are you going to have the where for all financially, mentally, or emotionally to recreate yourself in a different place? This is what a lot of your potential buyers and sellers, the conversations that they're actually starting to have. And if they're not having them now, they're going to have them in the future when they start seeing their taxes go up, when they start seeing a lot of their, essentially their freedoms of choice go away. And when they realize, you know what? I thought I had to live in Manhattan, but it turns out I can live in Paducah. Where's that? Con- Paducah. Paducah. <laughs> Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. I can live in Paducah, Kentucky. You know, God you bless like you guys. There. People in Ohio talk like that too. So yeah. if you talk like that, we're not making she's fun of you. She's got some beautiful homes for like 120 grand. Just amazing. I got an email, yeah. a text from somebody in Indiana I, yeah. who's a podcast listener. I'm sure they're listening right now. And you should have seen Indiana has some of the prettiest lakes. Yeah. And I was thinking I, the, the property was just gorgeous. And I was just thinking to myself, like, if I lived in, like, freaking, you know, Manhattan or if I Chicago. lived in any of these expensive areas sure. and I could move to this beautiful lakeside place and I could work remotely, maybe occasionally I have to fly in and make an appearance at sure. whatever the corporate mothership is. Why the hell would you I know. do that? I, I mean, I'm excited for what it does to small town America, as trite as that sounds. Uh, because, you know, a lot of those towns had been losing population for decades. I think about, you know, even if you drive through like Granger, Texas, you know, are towns like that going to have uh, more enthusiasm behind them? They already had a little inkling of it before the whole pandemic. But um, I, how, I think socially, options, think think about yeah. this, too. Uh-huh. How many people are going to um, I don't know how to word this. So I'll just say it. And you help me put the sentence together. OK, mm-hmm. that's how we did our book, too. Julie mm-hmm. and I would struggle through the thoughts, and then she'd basically make it cohesive. So this With is, a lot of good editors. We share a brain. <laughs> so how many people right now, as soon as they check out of having to be in those hyper-competitive environments where they're surrounded by other hyper-competitive people, if all of a sudden they're home base doing their job, usually at the same, if not a higher level, mm-hmm. how many of those spending more time with their families, spending more time with the things that they claim and then they rediscover are the most important things in life, how many of those people are going to actually stop wanting to spend money on the things they were spending money on just because they no longer feel like they have to keep up the Joneses. Or, or, or maybe they don't need to at that point. Well, you that, know, that's, your expenses but, are totally well, what different. What happens? I know. I, I hope that good things happen from that. I hope that we reinvest in 
you know, all being of the same tribe instead of being at each other's throats. Because yeah, me we're, too. Because we're all, you know, I, I just think about, like, uh, I have a client near uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and she's just, like, the hometown gal. You Look know? where we used to live. Well, just, in Columbus, too. Is in, like no, that. in New Albany. Yeah. Julie and I, in our, in our, you know, final bit of our, you know, professional real estate career, we moved to this really expensive area in unbelievably gorgeous called New Albany Country Club area. And still, when we drive back through there, we're like, holy crap, is this place done well? Yeah. <laughs> it's just shockingly awesome. nice. Anyway, so, but that area wasn't just keeping up with the Joneses. It was basically hiding in the tall grass with your sniper <laughs> rifle and blowing the heads off Joneses. It was so it was competitive. competitive. It yeah. was competitive for everything. And it was omnipresent competition. It was around constantly. And it wasn't until you stepped, and it wasn't that little New Albany Country Club area. It's because the people that were working there, generally speaking, were brought in from out of state. A lot of people from New York, they were working at the yeah. limited. The limited. And that was, that was like a, a smaller version of, like, imagine people in Manhattan and Chicago and, you know, just LA the, the pace and, of it. Yeah, Bird um, Streets and even West Hollywood, I all know, these places. It's, it's, the, it's Austin, the rat race. Right. I, you know, I listened to a podcast called Sticky Notes, which is run by, now I'm nerding out on the music stuff, so the conductors, right, interviewing each other, talking about music and stuff. And the conversation was, how have you dealt with, these were two conduct, very fairly famous up-and-coming conductors, one that uh, works in Switzerland, and has his own orchestra, but you know everything was canceled. And so their conversation with each other was, "How have you been dealing with the fact that you don't have concert after concert coming up, and rehearsal after rehearsal, and figuring out this score?" And they both agreed that they hadn't realized what the pace of that. And this is in the classical music world. This is not talking about downtown Manhattan financial district. You know, the, the, but they said how much they appreciate having family time. And time to actually study what they wanted to study, and the calmness of it. Are people going to go back? So let's That's, say that was the, co- the conversation. Is. Was nobody what will. what will post pandemic programming be like? And they had a lot of interesting thoughts about that. But it's absolutely not going to be the same. Do you think there's going to be a post pandemic? Do you think there's actually going to be a before I hope they and after? Get, I hope there's a vaccine. No, I'm asking you a question. I well, yeah, I think that there will be, just like there was after the Spanish flu and a bunch of other stuff. But I, don't I think, I there think will. it'll be different. I think there'll be a vaccine. But here's the next shoe to drop on that there's gonna be a whole bunch of people that refuse to get the vaccine well you know but and i don't think there's gonna be all a, that there won't be a post pandemic there'll be essentially a like an a, acceptance th- kind of exactly yeah. but what we're talking about will so even if there's a vaccine for this thing whenever it happens hopefully next year hopefully. W- okay but you know obviously they're still pushing that off yeah. and and then there's going to be all the things that julie said and oh my gosh and the conspiracy theories about the vaccine and you know whatever whatever right. but you know what were we talking about two days ago i was making an on, uh, an observation about you how you were sort of stuck in this uh, and I don't think you'd realize that you were stuck in this you know, middle ground of... Well, I feel like, I, I okay, so when is it going to be like, okay to go do our Europe trip? Yeah. You know, and you were saying, well, you know, maybe it'll end up being a variation of that and to stop expecting to wake up one day and everything's going to be just... Because it's swell. not. And I, I accept that. I, you know, I just have, uh, you know, travel, reverse travel anxiety, Yeah, I me guess. too. <laughs> actually dream about it but so yeah. like if you are stuck in an area in a, in a way if you're it's sort of like what what i was observing about julie and i observe about myself too truthfully and coaching clients like by being introspective forcing myself to be introspective then i can see the same you know behavior patterns in other people but by feeling like i'm in this waiting for th- waiting stage yeah. it's almost like sitting at the airport and you're just watching the big sign where all the you know outbound planes are on schedule, and you keep on seeing this plane that you're waiting to catch, it keeps on getting pushed back further and further and further. I actually had that happen in Dallas. Of course, everyone's <laughs> right? had that happen. You're using, using it as an example. It's yeah, annoying, right? It's horrible. And so you think your layover is you know half hour, forty five minutes, it's like and two then, days, and then like yeah, exactly. And then it you know pushes on to like seven o'clock. You're supposed to leave at like noon, and now it's seven o'clock, and the flights you know canceled. And I mean, the problem with being in the waiting stage of constantly waiting, mm-hmm. uh, waiting for that is that. It's it causes a you to not move forward in all the other ways that would be necessary. For example, maybe you switch airlines or maybe you get yeah. a rental car or maybe, you know, all these types of things opposed to just waiting for that number just yeah. to pop back up and say it's time for you to board. Because what if that never happens? Then how much time have you wasted Absolutely. waiting for that to happen? Absolutely. But do you understand? I do. I, and I think that's why you st- I think that's one of the reasons why you see still before the, the change happens, before the transitioning market really, truly hits. I think that totally. the people who get that and they're like, okay, you know what? 
if this is going to be around for a while, I don't want to be stuck in an apartment. I got to have a backyard for my kid to yep. play in. I, maybe I don't want to be in all this congestion. I got to do something now. And so I think a lot of that thought process is fueling when new good inventory hits the market. It's still being gobbled up. I, I think that that's unsustainable. But for our current time frame, you know, yeah, it is a good time to sell, actually. And we always joke that, you know, realtors, that's like their, their go-to script. Now's a great time to sell. Well, you know what? Now actually is a great time to sell, but not for probably more than, what, 90, 120 days. Maybe, maybe six months, but we'll see. Yeah, it's not six months. I don't this think is, so either. That's kind of Peter. We're already seeing some cracks. So I always like to, I cannot just uh, have a conversation where there is, aren't defined takeaways. And um, I, so I have some defined takeaways that popped into my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, here are my three. Okay. And you can agree with my three or you can come up with your own. We'll see. Okay. If I were listening right now to Julie and I talk, and let's just say we've um, you know, picked at some emotional mental scabs and you guys are realizing some of the things that we're saying, the way we're thinking, you're going to adapt it or at the very least you're going to pull on that string yourself and you're going to go down uh, and to start educating yourself. And you're wondering what three things that you should be doing. I'll tell you the three things. And I'm, I have absolute clarity about this and my caffeine has worn off. So that means <laughs> it's not a caffeine induced thought. Number one, I would absolutely make a decision now whether or not where you are is where you want to be. And if mm -hmm. it's not, then you need to get to where you want to be. And if your excuse is, I am a real estate professional and I've got myself established in this particular market, which I totally understand, reestablish yourself in a secondary market and then develop a plan to migrate to wherever that is um, over time. And I would suggest you look at, uh, you got to be really careful what state you choose or where in the world you choose, because if there's a chance, like I don't think Florida and Texas and other non-state uh, tax uh, uh, states will, I don't. I think they're going to see a net gain from what we're describing. I think they're going to see more people moving there. They're going to have uh, essentially the financial, you know, hardships that we are describing mm -hmm. that are look like they're baked in at this point will be felt the least in states that have net uh, inbound migration. We more have quite a few coaching clients that I could name who are, are already doing that. They're licensed in Oregon and Texas. They're licensed in Chicago and Florida. And they're working both. And, and you know, they're really making a good go of it. Because, right. you know, how long does it take you to get licensed in another state? It's not that bad. So move up. Like all of you, like I was on the phone with a friend of mine. And he was like, he wants to move here. Him is They're coming here the first or second week in August. And Jay Kinder. And he was uh -huh. saying, like, um, you know, I have always dreamed of living in a Caribbean uh, I, on a Caribbean island. And I was like, what the hell are you waiting for? Are you waiting for right. somebody to basically send you an invitation to get your butt here? There's no reason to wait. And, and he realized that too. And so it looks like they're going to move here, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, number two, I would say, so n number one, if you don't like where you are, or if you think you won't like where you are and say 24, 36 months, then start establishing yourself some other place. If you've got, you know, look guys, you might have to take a financial step back to essentially take a huge leap forward. Who cares? It's That's temporary the nature. though. Yeah. It's the nature of life. Go establish yourself. Someplace, yourself someplace more else if you don't like the freaking weather i mean that was the primary reason julie and i moved out of freaking columbus ohio which we love but the weather was horrible and we didn't want to live the rest of our lives having essentially half the year be a place where we just have to put up with it right there's only so many bad weather jokes that you can tell and hear per year and then you just don't want to live there anymore so there would be the first thing i would consider doing and if you see that the economic opportunity in your you know, where you're located now based on some of the things we talked about and things that maybe you know about that we didn't talk about. If you think that the opportunities are going to be brighter other places, then you actually have an obligation for the sake of your future self and for your family's future self to freaking move. So at least start laying the groundwork for that. Number two, this is what I would definitely do. I would absolutely positively start moving towards learning how to do distressed real estate. Look, guys, there's no doubt in my mind and that there's not going to be an enormous emerging opportunity that is going to be obvious to everyone probably in about when it's too late for them to take advantage mm -hmm. of it. So when everyone else is taking, I was talking about it, they're going to have already missed the boat. The, uh, distressed real estate is one of those things, especially short sales, REOs, the things that we coach you guys in our program. One of the many things we coach you to learn how to do in our coaching program. Those types of things are first come, first serve when it comes to getting the relationships with the servicers and with the banks. But the other thing that you miss out on by not starting to learn this stuff now and master it now is you you are your learning curve is going to be happening at the right, or at the exact right time. You're learning this before you have to know it. That way, when you have to know it, you've already learned it. Whereas your competitors, once they figure out they should have learned it when you were learning it, you guys following me on this? They're then going to have to play mm -hmm. catch up and you're going to have established yourself as somebody that knows how to get that 
that business done. That's the smartest thing you can be doing from a business perspective, primarily where your business coaches. The third thing I would be doing, and I would not even think twice about this, and I don't care what brokerage you're with or what sale price you're working on, I would absolutely join eXp Realty. And I'll tell you what I would do. I would do it immediately. Why eXp Realty? Because eXp is licensed in all 50 states, Canada, Australia, soon New Zealand, a lot of you know Caribbean islands they're going to be getting licensed in, Central America, whoever knows wherever they're going to go. But eXp Realty is a global country, or going to be a global company. Now, why is that important? Because it gives you the fluidity of movement. You can move in different places. You can sell real estate in different places and you always have a broker because eXp is virtual. But there's a lot of other advantages too. If we're talking ultimately about basically being financially free, which the word for that is called libertas. Libertas means freedom. If that's ultimately, if you really cut through all your layers, if you really cut through all of your what's my big why and why am I working and to go through all these sort of you know, pseudoscient mindset sort of mental masturbatory efforts, you're going to drill down and realize what you ultimately want is a sense of freedom. And that sense of freedom can only be obtained from having financial freedom where your money works for you. You no longer have to work for your money. Now, I'm here to tell you and listen to what I'm saying. I do not think rental properties are the go-to investment anymore. I don't. And Julie and I have dozens of them, and we're not going to be buying any more unless we can get them at an absolute great price where the numbers make sense. We are fearful, logically fearful of what's going to happen with property taxes and what's going to happen with association dues and what's going to happen with property values. So those three things are probably going to ruin the investment thesis on most of the things we otherwise would have bought, even if they go on some dramatic sale, which they probably won't. So when you look at your opportunities as a normal middle class, you know, person like Julie and I, and we even were less than that when we got married, right? We were poor and church mice. <laughs> with student loans. With yeah. student loans, right? So if you look at like where we came from when we were growing up, you know, Julie and I are, are in, we're in our, you know, well, I'm 50 and Julie's, you know. I'm in my 40s. She's 39 plus. Yeah, she's in her 40s. <laughs> she's 39 <laughs> plus 10, but we don't have to talk about that. But if you if you look at sort of where we, when we were coming up and a lot of you were coming up, investment properties were the go-to thing. And in your minds, you're now saying, well, they're the go-to thing again. I'm waiting for shit to go on sale. That's what a lot of you are doing, right? Well, me too. My logical thinking is I'm going to buy stuff when it goes on sale. What if it goes on sale at the same time the carrying costs go higher and your net profit from that investment property goes to crap? Well, then I still have appreciation, which is, by the way, the dumbest reason to buy real estate because it doesn't always appreciate. Well, you you might have appreciation, but it's going to be gobbled up by the transaction fees from the excise taxes or the transfer taxes or the, you, see, you guys know what I'm getting at? So the one easiest way for all of us normal people to obtain you know, build wealth over time, which was real estate, is in flux. It just is. And that's scary. And like you guys who are 1031ing and you're flipping and you were never taking profits on the money from the flip and you're 1030ing it to another one. If Biden is the president and if that happens and you now have to pay taxes and 1031ing real estate is gone, your investment thesis is dead. You're no longer going to have make any money on flipping. You guys realize all these things are saying what I'm saying are true. That's the reason it matters who you vote for and that you vote. But you make those decisions yourself. Where you go with this? EXP Realty. And I'll tell you why. It's a very simple reason. Most of you, all of you practically, will save money in broker commission splits. All of you will have at least, if not better, of a broker experience than you're having now. These things are baked in. The biggest reason why, and I'm talking strictly from an investment perspective, is the, the revenue share that EXP offers. The revenue share model that EXP offers, once you, as actually I mentioned his name, once Jay said this, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you understand right. how it could benefit you, I would never buy a rental property. If I'm talking now to the formidable years of well, but, but Julie, to be fair, Julie though, and I, Julie and I were in our twenties, right? It wasn't an option. If I had revenue share as an option, and I was listening to you know the fifty-year-old Tim talk on oh, a yeah. podcast, you know, and I was talking to the you know twenty-two and twenty-three-year-old Tim and Julie, basically when we got into real estate, mm -hmm. and I was talking to them, I would tell them not to buy rental properties. I would tell them to focus on selling real estate, focusing on producing enough net profit, focusing on being debt-free, but then put discernible, directed effort towards uh, your revenue share uh, and helping uh, sponsor agency DXP because the nature of the money that you make from revenue share is, you know, Julie says the real estate gods. And we actually had someone ask us if there really were real estate gods. No, that was a real text I got. No, it was an email I got. They thought it was like, I, anyway. 
Sometimes you just <laughs> you just ignore emails and you just move on. Anyway, so that did happen, yeah. but I digress. It is a gift from the real estate gods. It is a, an amazing opportunity for all of you. EXP is growing so fast. I mean, already this year, uh, it looks like EXP is going to maybe increase by 50%. Maybe, I think year to date, the statistic was they've increased by 64%. So Julie and I got involved with EXP about 16 months ago, and I have to tell you, it's probably the best financial move we've ever made because not only, and it's also a wonderful place because we've made a lot of new great friends. It's exciting because the people that we've involved in EXP that are part of our group, which by the way, we call Libertas, some of those people are now making really good money from revenue share. And they send me little texts of their the amount of money they got transferred on the 20th of the month. And the number is building every month. And I'm seeing these people for the very first times in their lives experience true financial freedom where their money is working for them and they no longer work for their money. There's so many people that I am confident would never in their lifetimes, in 10 of their lifetimes, obtain any sense of financial freedom, let alone security. They're doing it in a year, two years, three years because of the amazing thing that um, you know that Glenn created at EXP Realty with the revenue share. Well, it accomplishes so many things at the same time, right? You have to put your license somewhere. Yep. You have to reduce your costs. You don't you want to have revenue share coming in that doesn't have expenses against it that's relatively passive, so superior to, you know, property it's not even funny you don't have to have a home warranty on it it doesn't get clogged toilets exactly. it doesn't pay its rent late it just keeps coming in as you said you can't unsee the model no nope. and honestly if you haven't examined how that actually works yet you are doing yourself a disservice and i i truly believe that because it, it i love things that are that efficient efficiently accomplish more than one thing from one decision so you're saving money you're making money you're hanging your license in a reputable place that's growing and is going to serve you well, look at EXP I mean, stock. I mean, EXP stock during what should have been the absolute worst time for right. a publicly traded real estate company during the pandemic. It's doubled in value. I know. It's amazing. Why is it doubled in value? And that, Be- that's just part of the model, too. Right. That's you, not you, the whole thing. Yeah. Investors are, and you guys get EXP stock essentially given to you for you know selling houses, for sponsoring people when they sell house, all those types of things. You know, the EXP stock in itself is creating, you know, frankly, savings plans and, and wealth for a lot of agents that never would have had it themselves. Julie and I know people that were uh, early adapters in DXP way before us who essentially guys became millionaires because of EXP stock. The EXP is going to be one of these companies that goes down as being one of the greatest ideas uh, and the, one of the greatest ideas to be implemented at the highest level because of the changing market. Whereas all these other you know, companies are all licking their wounds, wondering what direction they're going to go, and they're losing agents or they're essentially not adding agents, EXP is growing and it's increasing in size. Why? Because all the things that are about a thousand other things that I haven't even talked about with all of you guys. I want you guys to join Julie and I. I want you to partner with us on our revenue share team at EXP. Email me or text me. The easiest way to get hold of me is just text me at 512-758-0206. Text me and just text me EXP at 512-758-0206. Text me if you're just getting started thinking about it. Text me if you're just ready to join and you want, you're looking for a sponsor. I want you to consider having Julie and I be your sponsor at EXP. I want to talk with you about it. I want you to see the opportunity that it truly is. And then when we're having, you know, it's a year from now, it's maybe two years from now, and you're looking back, you're going to say, thank you, past Tim and Julie, right? Or thank you, your name, right? Past your name for having made the decision. The time to do this is now because you have some breathing room. A lot of you have closings and you have pendings, you have money coming in, but it's a perfect time for you to move over to EXP and make the most because what's going to happen next is there's going to be an enormous surge of people joining EXP as they then wake up to realize that they can't make their continue to keep their brokerages alive. Agents who are going to say, holy crap, I should have listened to Tim and Julie a year or two ago, and now I'm waking up to this market and this world that's completely different all the things we just talked about all these things we're saying are absolutely true and they're going to happen in one degree or another and intellectually you know what we're saying is true you know everything that we're telling you is going to happen will happen who knows if we're right about our timing but what i am positive is the perfect timing right now for you to absolutely do is join julie and i and be part of our exp team so do consider texting me at 512-758-0206 so julie you know i couldn't let a podcast go without pitching exp <laughs> well, of course i can't not. Do you it. shouldn't i shouldn't 
I right? mean, it's a I conversation that we always have is, you know, if we know about this and we don't talk about it, what kind of schmucks are we? Well, it's like if I, you so know. you and I know that yeah. the distress train is, is boarding, right? Absolutely. And if you and I weren't to tell them about it, because we, we would be out of integrity, which we're be, not down with. We'd be assholes, basically, yes. right? I mean, <laughs> one way to truthfully, say. yeah. I mean, if we don't no, tell right. them what we know, right. then we don't deserve the right for them to listen to us and for I them agree. to buy our book and for them for us to enjoy the things in life that we enjoy. That's right. We we will stop lose. We'll stop earning that right to be of service yeah. to them if we stop if we start being self serving. Exactly. Right now, the nice thing about EXP is we are being self serving, well, <laughs> but at the same time, both. it's also essentially serving, serving them. them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that should be your next step right now because it solves so many issues. So can you top those three things for no, your big takeaways? No, I completely agree with all three. Yeah, I sold all three of them pretty good. Those are I? good. Yeah. Those are good. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. You got anything else you want to say? You know, go sell a house. So you know what we have to do <laughs> next, right? Our big walk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go on a six or seven mile walk in Puerto Rico. It's not too hot, no? It's like 90 something, but we'll, we'll live, I suppose. Yeah, Drink I a know. lot of water. Yeah, drink a lot of water. But we're going to go on our big hike around the property. Um, and we're going to, you know, it's, you know, it's fun is seeing all these tourists come back, staying yeah, at the Ritz. Nice. It is sure. nice. Yeah. I'll tell you guys a funny inside joke. So like the, you get, I mentioned earlier, we can tell a tourist from a local. And the reason is, is because the tourists are always wearing really nice looking resort new wear. clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and those of us who live here are wearing workout clothes. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah, and the, it's and a lot true. of the people who live here are a little hairy. You know, the guys grow beards. And, mm-hmm. you know, but it is kind of funny. The locals, they'll show up and it looks like they just literally walked out of some sort of fashion catalog. The it's ladies, like a James Bond movie. The ladies are always so Decked pretty out. and dressed nice. I know. Sweating their kahunes off because it's That's freaking true. 90 degrees. You know, but still, it's, it's good fun. to see back. Yeah. Oh, the other reason you could tell locals because they always get lost. That's yeah. They do look like deer in the headlights a lot. <laughs> yeah, we were. But like, the first time we came here, we were lost the entire trip. So you do realize that the yeah. second time we came here, where we're living now, was only about a year ago, right? Yeah, I know. It's a lot happens. In but here. You, you know, Julie, this is the reason that we're legit is because we did not even have all the answers. We didn't even no. have all the questions to ask. We didn't even know about our six mile trail existing when yes, we moved here. We didn't. Your mom discovered it. My mom did, yeah. On a, on a golf cart. Rockefeller cart ride. Nature Trail. Right. And Rockefeller, yeah, from the Rockefeller family, you guys know that name. But we were willing for, because we trusted people that had come before us who we trusted them having already done the research and we know them to be those people to have been really quality people. And they told us this is the reason it was good for us. And we did not even know the questions to ask to qualify what they were saying. We just followed blindly. Because well, that's one of our trust great, people. But that's one of our greatest yeah. strengths, you know, honestly. Absolutely. It's the people around us that we trust, that we know that have earned our trust. Yeah. Year in, year out Because for they've earned it too, you know. They've, yeah. they've had the experiences too. Yeah. Hopefully you guys see us that way. That's hopefully the way um, you, you feel about us because, you know, at the end of the day, that's what our highest and truest purpose is, is to be of service to all of you. Um, and when you listen to us on our podcast, especially the Sunday one, which is definitely my favorite one of the week, <laughs> yes. what's more fun? It is. More casual. It's more work, though, truthfully. I know. Why is that? Um, you know, because during the weekday ones, you and I usually have specific things that we want to talk about. And the specific things that we talk about, we usually have organized and we yeah. can just read them. Service. Or we've talked about them a million times before. That's true. The one on Sunday, you and I are having to basically fire on all cylinders. Where if we're being honest, the ones during the week, we can kind of cruise a little bit. A little bit, maybe. Yeah, because we're doing more core content that we're just so familiar with. And content with. presents itself over the course of coaching calls and things like that. Yeah. And you and I talk about things that would be things that we wouldn't normally, like the tax thing we talked about. Yeah, that's not a normal podcast show. Right. And we work that's through true. all those thoughts when we're on our Sunday show. You guys mm-hmm. listen to us actually working through some of these things. So that's the reason Hopefully I like it. Hopefully our listeners will as well. Yeah, exactly. So in the meantime, guys, if you want to join EXP, if you want to be part of our group, feel free to text me. Um, it is uh, 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Go ahead and uh, text me. And yeah, go back and listen to all of our past, pa- our past podcasts are available on Stitcher, iTunes. This continues to be the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate agents in the nation. Oh, and Harris Rules, thank you for continuing to make that. Uh, one of the, I think it's right now the number one real estate book on Amazon, you know, as far as real estate, uh, uh, a book for real estate agents. That is true. Um, there's other... Yeah, and the Audible book came out last week and we're getting a lot of great re- uh, feedback on that. The book now has nearly 400 five-star reviews. So please do consider purchasing the book. I think it'll give you guys a greater insight into the direction that you can have no matter what direction the market is going, no matter what direction 
you know, the politics go or whatnot. Harris Rules was designed to be evergreen and give you that path forward that all of you guys need in addition to our podcast. So if you need us for anything, always know that you can reach out to us. If you want to join EXP, text me directly at 512-758-0206. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.